Yeah, I, I think the catalyst for the next bull run is is an educated market and an educated set of of uh, policymakers and regulators and educated media. And uh, what we've gotten over the past six to nine months is a very expensive education, right? People learned a lot from Terra Luna. They learned a lot from Three Arrows. They learned a lot from the meltdowns of Voyager and Celsius. They learned a lot from FTX. MicroStrategy executive chairman and renowned Bitcoin investor Michael Saylor believes proper and adequate education will be the catalyst for the next Bitcoin bull run. In a recent interview with Blockware Intelligence, the renowned American entrepreneur and business executive explains that we already got a lot of that much-needed education in 2022. Following the Terra Luna and the FTX collapse, several Bitcoin maximalists have pointed out that everything proves all other crypto assets are unregulated securities backed by nothing by air. In his interview with Blockware, Saylor explains that every collapse has proven the need for Bitcoin's proof-of-work mechanism, despite the arguments against the network's high-energy use. According to the former MicroStrategy chief executive officer, he would not spend a penny on any other crypto asset because they were built from nothing and have almost as much risk of failure as FTX. As tragic as these crashes have been, Saylor says there has been at least one silver lining. According to the American business executive, the crash of Luna, USD, and FTX has taught regulators and media personalities the clear difference between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Last week, following the FTX collapse, Rostin Benham, the head of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission stated that Bitcoin is the only crypto asset that can be viewed as a commodity. Bannon made this statement during an invite-only crypto event at Princeton University while answering a question on which crypto assets should be seen as commodities and which ones qualify as securities. With a reply, the CFTC executive recanted an earlier statement he made in October when he said Ether could also be viewed as a commodity. Saylor also discusses his overall outlook for Bitcoin in 2023, 2024, and 2025 while giving an important suggestion to all Bitcoin investors. We will now take even Michael Saylor's interview on Bitcoin, cryptocurrency regulation, and price volatility. Please watch, share, and like this video. Also, ensure you subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. I think that if you uh, if you look at uh, coverage of of um, Bitcoin and the crypto world on CNBC, on Bloomberg, in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, in uh, in most mainstream media, it's much more sophisticated today than it was 12 months ago. I think uh, I, you know before we say you know Bitcoin, not shitcoin, you know, but now you say oh Bitcoin, not FTT. Do you understand the difference? Like, oh, oh, I get it now. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin, not Luna. Now, I, oh yeah, the Luna thing went to zero. Why? Because it was backed by nothing, right? We used to say proof of work is better than proof of stake. Well, why is it better, right? Proof of stake could do whatever you want. Well, proof of stake is what FTT was. It was backed by one person. That was a mistake, right? You know, uh, now, now when you try to explain why is it that you would want to have 10 gigawatts of energy and millions of Bitcoin mining rigs running the network, it's because you're actually backed by something tangible. And, and the alternative is you have Luna and FTT and Serum backed by air. And uh, so I, I think for the industry to move forward, the market has to grow up and be educated. And when senators... Like senators didn't really understand the difference between um, Bitcoin and even Ethereum, right? As late as like two months ago, three months ago, a lot of people in the Senate said, well, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're both commodities. And of course, Bitcoin's a commodity, but Ethereum is not a commodity. Ethereum is, is a security. It's a staked token. And uh, there's nothing backing it but the trust that you have in a small handful of people and small organizations. So... Um, you know, when we had uh, the bozeman Stabana bill that kind of didn't distinguish the difference, when you had regulators in, in D.C. that didn't know the difference, I think that was tr when you have crypto lobbyists and when you have uh, mainstream media that don't know the difference, the, the industry is held back. And we really needed to have the meltdown of, of the crypto casinos and the meltdown of these crypto tokens and the meltdown of these unstable, you know, 
unstable altcoins like UST, in order for Congress and the Senate and the administration to recognize, you know, what what these asset classes are. And I think that um, we're now getting to the point where people are starting to recognize there's something that's uh, a cryptocurrency, maybe like Circle or Tether, and, and for it to be an ethical, properly engineered, economically sound cryptocurrency, you're going to have to have a public issuer that's transparent uh, in its assets that then backs the uh, token with no risk assets. So if I issue $100 billion worth of stablecoin backed by $100 billion worth of short-term U.S. treasuries, and if I'm a publicly traded company and I disclose my balances every week, then maybe I will be trusted. Uh, there's no guarantee. Uh, there's still counterparty risk. But the point is that would be the foundation to issue a digital currency like a circle or like a tether, and there's a market for that. There's a, there's a, a growing awareness of a digital commodity. Bitcoin is the only one. The chair of the SEC has said Bitcoin's the digital commodity. The chair of the CFTC has said Bitcoin is the only digital commodity. This is really critical. The fact that you now have regulators in D.C. that universally acknowledge there is one digital commodity and they uh, and you have a set of people that now understand a digital commodity is an asset without an issuer. I think that's a really big development in the industry, and it's a milestone. And 12 to 24 months ago, there's still a lot of confusion. I mean, a lot of a lot of people were trying to legislate what is a commodity. Like you can't make Ethereum a commodity by passing a law. It's not you know it's like trying to pass a law that makes like gold a security or makes oil a security. You can't make it a security. It's a commodity. And you can't do the opposite. You can't make Facebook stock a commodity by passing a law. Guess what? The only two commodities are oil, natural gas, or oil and Facebook stock. You can't pass laws that make something a different asset class. There is so much to be uncovered in the investigation of the bankrupt cryptocurrency exchange FTX, especially the highly suspicious relationship between the former billionaire co-founder SBF and U.S. regulators like Benham and SEC Chair Gary Gansler. Hopefully, the disgraced former crypto darling will be clarifying some of these relationships when he appears before the House Financial Services Committee on Tuesday. After some back and forths, SBF has agreed to appear before the committee to discuss the collapse of FTX and Alameda Research. More on that after another clip from Michael Saylor's interview. We have uh, we've had some some deadlock there because of confusion and because of that tug of war. We were stuck in that deadlock because you had people like FTX and Sam Bankman Freed dropping hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to corrupt the political process. They were corrupting the politicians. They were trying to interfere. They were inserting into that legislation things that would be beneficial to the crypto industry and the air token producers that would be detrimental to the world, detrimental to the $100 trillion securities industry, detrimental to every citizen on earth, detrimental to Bitcoin, detrimental to anybody that believes in truth and honesty and justice. So they were definitely malefactors. Um, they were trying to, in essence, bribed the CFTC. They wanted to actually funnel a bunch of crypto exchange fees into the CFTC in return for light reg uh, regulation or no regulation. So that was the status quo six months ago. And if the crypto industry had continued uh, to succeed with pumping of the air tokens like Terra and Luna and FTT and Serum, and if they continued to be able to run this you know, crypto exchange like FTX and continue to steal through Alameda and then move money through all sorts of dark pools, then you might have had a very corrupt system, not to mention the fact that they're literally corrupting the journalists and the mainstream media that are writing the story by showering hundreds of millions of dollars on them or their cronies, if not billions and billions. So... We've hit a significant milestone, and the milestone is a, a virtuous one. The meltdown of this crypto complex means that the ability to corrupt the establishment with counterfeit money has been severely impaired. It hasn't completely stopped. There's still some transgression, but it's definitely been impaired. 
And uh, I think there are a lot of honest people that are genuinely interested in doing the right thing for the world that now have had their eyes opened. And so the, our ability to move forward with ethically sound, economically sound, uh, technically sound digital currencies, digital commodities, and or digital securities is much greater. And I, and I think that's where we are today. So I, I think that this will be remembered as a difficult year and a transition year, but 2023 should be much better. And 2024, we should be picking up a good amount of momentum. And I think we get into 2025, and I think then we're really in the main uh, early years of institutional adoption in a big way. And And my advice to anybody is, you know, huddle. As stated earlier, SBF has agreed to appear before a House committee on Tuesday. He made this known in a series of tweets on Friday, leaving members of the Twitter crypto community wondering if he dared to step foot on U.S. soil. Here are tweets. I still do not have access to much of my data, professional or personal. So there is a limit to what I will be able to say, and I won't be as helpful as I'd like. But as the committee still thinks it would be useful, I am willing to testify on the 13th. I will try to be helpful during the hearing and shed what light I can on FTX US's solvency and American customers' pathways that could return value to users internationally, what I think led to the crash and my own failings. I had thought of myself as a model chief executive officer who wouldn't become lazy or disconnected, which made it that much more destructive when I did. Hopefully, people can learn from the difference between who I was and who I could have been. What are your thoughts on Michael Saylor's interview and the upcoming congressional hearing with Sam Bankman Freed? Please drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.